Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Screencast 12. I'm your host, Dr. Toby Brooks. And in Screencast 11, we talked about the muscles of the spine, the skeletal and muscular anatomy of the lumbar and thoracic spine in particular. And in this lesson, we're making our way up the chain, so to speak, moving superiorly and looking at some of the smaller muscles associated with the head and neck. So I would venture to say that for most of you who have been in athletics and maybe have trained yourself, most of these muscles are going to be unfamiliar to you. Now, if you're interested in a career as an athletic trainer, as a physical therapist, occupational therapist, these are going to be muscles that you're going to learn at some point in your career. But for now, they're not, as we've talked about before, bodybuilder muscles. Uh, I've never looked at anybody and thought, wow, look at the longest cap and eye on that guy. Um, it's just not that way. However, injuries to these muscles can certainly negatively impact performance, can add to pain. So it's important that we understand where they are, what they do, and how they function. So we're going to kind of look at these in groups. So the rectus capitis group we'll look at initially, along with the longus capitis muscle uh, and the obliquus capitis, all kind of grouped together right at the head, at the atlas and the axis. And then kind of making our way down the cervical spine, looking at the semispinalis capitis, the longus coli group, the intertransversary that, that are deep muscles all the way down the spine along with the rotatories and the semispinalis muscles. So we'll start with the rectus, rectus capitis anterior. So very small muscle that uh, originates, or a pair of muscles rather, that originate on the base of the transverse process of C1 right there on the atlas and insert on to the occipital bone. So in isolation, these are going to lead to head, fl head flexion uh, to that same side and functioning together they're going to lead to common flexion in the uh, the head uh, and it's innervated by the nerve root at C1 and C2. Okay, rectus capitis lateralis as the name implies located a little bit more lateral on that atlas between the atlas and the skull so it originates on that transverse process and inserts into the occipital bone. Uh, it's a lateral flexor uh, when functioning by itself. If you, f if you fire it both sides, left and right, uh, they would basically kind of counteract one another. So it would be uh, useful for isometric action to stabilize the head or even eccentric action, like in the event that an athlete's head is being shoved away, like they're being tackled, something like that. So this muscle as well is going to get its innervation through the C1, C2 uh, nerve root. And then the rectus capitis posterior we see here, um, it originates on the axis. C2 is the axis of the spine and inserts in the occipital bone. So it's going to be a head extensor. Uh, it's got a longer lever arm than either the lateralis or anterior and it's also going to assist with rotation to the same side and it gets its innervation from C1. So that's the rectus capitis group. Okay, Longus capitis, as the name implies, is longer. Okay, and Anytime we see capitis, think skull or, or head, it's going to originate on the transverse processes of C3 through 6, so kind of the mid section of the cervical spine, if you will. Also inserts into the base of the skull there at the occipital bone and it too is going to be a head flexor since it's anteriorly located and, and a uh, rotator to the same side. And as it descends down the cervical spine, it's going to get its innervation through the corresponding levels of the uh, cervical nerve roots one through four. Now the obliquus group, uh, anytime we see that term oblique, just like we talked about in the, in the abdomen or, or in the chest, trunk, um, it's not running in a true straight plane orientation. So the obliquus capitis is no different. So we see uh, the superior kind of runs superior medially and the obliquus capitis inferior runs uh, uh, inferior, lateral, inferior medially. I'll get there. Uh, so it's going to originate on the transverse process of the atlas and insert into the occipital bone. Uh, so you see it's its orientation is, is kind of similar to 
that lateralis that we've already looked at. So it's a head extensor and then a lateral flexor to the same side. It's important to look at when we look at these muscles. I mean, you consider just how short they are. Consider just how small the lever arms are that they are functioning at. And you see pretty quickly, these are not muscles of power or uh, or of strength. These are muscles of position, fine movers. So if you recall when we talked about the rotator cuff, how it's, you know, we're, we're not going to train the rotator cuff with lots of weight. We're going to train it with repetitions, light weights, because those are muscles of fine position. And these are very much the same. Um, we're not going to maximize head strength by isolating these muscles by themselves. Okay. Blicus capitis inferior, if we see again running from lateral superior to inferior medial. Uh, it's going to originate off of that spinous process of C2 and insert into the, uh, the transverse process of uh, C1. And this is going to be a, a same side rotator. Okay, semispinalis capitis uh, originates on the transverse process of the lower of four, five, six, and seven cervical vertebrae. It's going to insert uh, somewhat laterally on the occipital bone. It's going to be a head extensor and a rotator to the opposite side. Kind of like we talked about the sternocleidomastoid anteriorly in last time, in the lesson last time, uh, this functions kind of similarly on the posterior side and it gets its innervation from C1. Okay, the coli group. So we see longest coli here it's basically running down the uh, the anterior aspect and and uh, attaching to the vertebral bodies uh, and the transverse processes of the the middle cervical vertebrae, and it's going to insert into the anterior arch of the atlas. So uh, this is going to be a flexor since it's anterior. Think you know abs are anterior, they're flexors. So longus coli is anterior, uh, it too is going to be largely a flexor. And it gets its nerve roots through those corresponding levels, or its innervation rather, through those corresponding nerve roots. And then the longus coli inferior oblique, we see here, um, bodies of the upper thoracic vertebrae and inserts into the transverse processes of the lower cervical vertebrae. So this too is going to be a spinal flexor. Um, I would venture a guess. Now doing an EMG study on these muscles is going to be very very difficult. They're deep in a very vulnerable position. Uh, if we were to try to do needle EMG or something like that, uh, it would be very disconcerting. So um, I would just simply guess here that these muscles oftentimes are going to function synergistically. They're going to work together. So very little of what we do is going to isolate any of these. So functionally, if we're trying to train the flexors in the neck, we might do some manual resistance exercises where we're having the athlete push against our resistance. Uh, but again, those the prime movers are, are going to be predominant there. Uh, these deeper neck muscles may be better for isometric or even eccentric action where we're just having them resist against our uh, our force uh, and, and hold a steady position. And that's relatively functional. I mean, we see that in contact and collision sports all the time, hockey, football, whatever, uh, where that athlete has to absorb an impact and, and try to maintain posture or position. Okay, longest coli vertical. Uh, you see here kind of the, the middle portion. It's going to originate through the lower cervical and upper thoracic vertebrae and insert into the vertebral bodies of the upper to middle cervical spine. It's also going to be a flexor and it's going to get its innervation through C2 through C6. All right, that leads us to the intertransversary. As the name implies, inter between, transverse refers to the transverse process. So the intertransversary run from literally C1 through L5, the entire spine. Okay, so those adjacent vertebrae have small muscular connections between each of them. So if one side contracts, it's going to lateral flex to that same side. Uh, these 
small muscles are going to get their innervation through the spinal nerve root. And it's important to note that these are going to be really deep. It's going to be hard to palpate these. Uh, we can palpate the spinous process, but not the transverse processes. So in the case of uh, low back pain that's away from midline, or any spine pain for that matter, it could potentially involve the intertransversary, but there's a lot of overlying musculature that we would have to palpate through first. So it's really hard to definitively diagnose an injury to a specific intertransversary muscle. Likewise, the multifidi run segment by segment, but instead of just simply being from one segment to another, the multifidi actually run at an oblique uh, inferior lateral uh, arrangement. So they're going to originate on the transverse processes of C4 through C7, all 12 thoracic vertebrae, all five lumbar vertebrae, and then also the sacrum. And they're going to insert into the spinous process of, of, of a particular vertebrae that's, that is superior to the origin. So this is going to be an extensor and a rotator to the opposite side. And just like we talked about with the inner transversary, it's going to get its innervation from the spinal nerves. The rotatories run a little bit more uh, horizontal, so they're going to originate on the transverse process and insert into a spinous process of a superior vertebrae. These, as you might guess, based on the name, are going to contribute to rotation, and any one segment probably isn't going to be enough to really notice. These are going to work in unison with one another in order to produce uh, a torque or a twist from segment to segment up the uh, spinal column. Two more to go and we're done with muscles for the semester. So first off, semispinalis services. This originates from the transverse processes of the upper thoracic vertebrae and then it runs centrally and inserts into the spinous processes of C2 through C5. So this is an extensor. Again, posterior think extension, anterior think flexion. Uh, like the others in this vicinity, it's going to get its innervation from the spinal nerves. All right, last one, semispinalis thoracis. This one originates on the transverse processes of the lower thoracic vertebrae and then inserts into the spinous process of lower cervical and upper thoracic vertebrae. Uh, this is going to be an extensor, and it utilizes, again, the spinal nerve roots. So that is it. The only two screencasts we have left are some application lessons where we're going to look at some motion analysis related to the upper and the lower extremity. So until then, I appreciate your attention, and if you've got any questions, let me know. Dr. Brooks signing off.